Have you ever wondered uh, about what is really happening around us today? Are you very happy uh, when you listen to the uh, uh, evening news? I've noticed, especially in local news, that um, frequently about the first 15, 20 minutes are dealing with uh, various kinds of violence not throughout the world, but just here in the local communities. And uh, I was just wondering, have you ever had the question in mind, why in the world does God allow all of this wickedness to uh, uh, thrive in the world? Actually, you're in good company if you have these thoughts. Because the biblical author that I would like to share with you today had exactly the same kind of problems. But his uh, problem was even more serious, as I hope you will be able to recognize. But uh, I think we can learn something from it anyway. Uh, if it wasn't for the uh, last Sabbath uh, uh, court, uh, lesson, I just wonder how many of you have recently read a book in the Bible called Habakkuk. Uh, when I have uh, presented something similar uh, in other churches, uh, I have seen people uh, questioning Habakkuk. Uh, what's that? They don't even uh, know where it is in the Bible. And another thing also is that uh, he is to be found among what is called the minor prophets. And, some, uh, and we, as human beings, we are usually not very interested in minor things. We want to uh, concentrate on major things. So uh, we are not, uh, people in general, in, not only in our church, but in churches in general, are not very familiar with the messages of the minor prophets, because they think they are uh, basically unimportant. But the question is, um, how long is it since you have heard a sermon dealing with the book of Habakkuk? I'm not aware of uh, too many sermons that I have heard. I, don't, uh, I wonder if I have ever heard a sermon dealing with the book of Habakkuk. Uh, and actually, the book of Habakkuk is uh, a very interesting uh, book because it is unique uh, among the prophetic books. Usually, uh, we think of a prophet as being a messenger of God to uh, God's people, usually with a message of rebuke or encouragement uh, to repent and uh, also occasional predictions. But Habakkuk doesn't fit that picture. He is unique among all of them. He is referred to as a prophet, but he is not depicted as a messenger from God uh, to, uh, to, to people, and he has no spe specific message to anyone. Most of the prophets, they uh, spoke to a certain group, to certain individuals. But Habakkuk doesn't have any, uh, doesn't specify any particular message to anyone in particular. Instead, we find uh, basically a dialogue between Habakkuk and God in which he accuses God of not doing what God is supposed to do. That sounds strange, that, to have a book in the Bible dealing with that. Individual accusing God of not doing his business. But let's go back and look uh, at the book. And uh, I would encourage you, to, uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, to follow along, because I will be referring to uh, various texts uh, in the Bible. If you're aware of uh, where the book of Habakkuk is to be found, 
is after the book of Daniel, who is the last of the major prophets, um, and it is uh, close to the end, uh, a little bit further than the middle of the minor prophets, Habakkuk. Uh, actually, we, know very, uh, we don't know really anything about Habakkuk except his name. And his name uh, means actually to embrace or to cling. And it's very interesting, if you think about it, that the, the prophets uh, in the Bible, their names usually summarizes their message. Daniel, of, uh, we often think about Daniel in connection with prophecies and uh, the message of judgment. But actually, Daniel means God is my judge. Um, Isaiah is often referred to as the gospel prophet, but that's exactly what his name means. Uh, uh, the Lord is uh, uh, salvation. And uh, Hosea means salvation. So Habakkuk has the name of clinging or embracing. But we can, uh, and we don't know anything uh, really about uh, what, uh, when he was a uh, prophet, but the context seems to in indicate that he was at work during the end of uh, the southern kingdom in Israel, a few years uh, before its collapse. And he was a contemporary of other known prophets, such as Ezekiel and Daniel or around uh, 607 uh, uh, before Christ. But again, let's put uh, the book a little bit in perspective. Uh, that helps us to understand what he is really talking about. Following the death of uh, King Solomon, who was the last great king of the uh, united uh, Israel, the original kingdom split into two parts. Ever thought of uh, what was the reason for the split? It uh, shows us that uh, there's nothing new under the sun. Because there is, uh, it was, uh, the reason for the split was dissatisfaction um, <clears throat> with Solomon's extreme taxation of the people. So the taxes, people were uh, uh, fed up with all the taxes that they had to pay. So 10 of the tribes, they seceded um, and wanted to establish a new kingdom. And so there were only two left in the southern part, and that was the kingdom of Judah. Uh, the northern kingdom, or Israel, those 10 tribes, were ultimately ruled by 19 kings. And uh, the Bible tells us that none of them really uh, worked or walked according to God's ways. The southern kingdom of Judah continued for 136 years longer than the northern kingdom, and they had altogether 20 kings, and only eight of whom are said to have walked according to God's guidance. Toward the end, a few years uh, before we have uh, the book of Habakkuk, a child king uh, came on the throne at the age of eight. He was eight years of age when he uh, came to the throne. And he ruled for uh, about 30 years. His name was Josiah. And he is the only king in the uh, whole history of Israel uh, about whom nothing negative is being said uh, as to his relationship with God. He is the best known for his attempt to counteract the work of his father and grandfather. It's kind of interesting, both of them were kings, who were perhaps the worst kings uh, uh, Judah ever had. So the worst uh, kings had the best, uh, or the worst father had the, uh, the best king, the best son. The Bible tells us that his grandfather, Manasseh, did more wicked things 
than all the surrounding nations whom God had told the people to destroy because of their wickedness. Uh, but interestingly enough, toward the end of his life, he turned to God and God accepted him. So there is a hope, even if uh, we are not, have not reached it uh, yet. And he was succeeded by his son, Amon, who continued in his father's evil footsteps until his servants conspired against him and killed him, and the people replaced him with his young son, Josiah. So his, uh, uh, the servants of the king, they were fed up with his wickedness and they killed him. And bear in mind, I'm not talking about the pagan nations. This is the people of God that I'm talking about. And then as the people were cleaning out the temple in accordance with the king Josiah's command when he was about 20 years of age, and they removed all the idols and images that the previous kings had placed in the temple or in the church, and they discovered a scroll which startled them. It was a Bible. They sent it to the king, who was about 25 years of age at that time, Josiah, and the, he sent it on to the prophetess Hulda, who told them about the consequences of not obeying it. Imagine the surprise, cleaning in the church and finding a Bible. Even the priests were surprised to find a Bible in the church. Does that tell you something about the condition of the church at the time? And as a result, King Josiah proclaimed uh, a revival throughout the land, the greatest revival that the nation had ever experienced. But he found that cleaning up the country was the easy part, but it was quite another to try to clean the hearts of the people. Thirteen years later, he died in a battle uh, and the people made his uh, second son a king. Three months later, the Egyptian army it was on its way back from warfare in, in what is now Lebanon and Syria, and deposed the king, replacing him with his older brother, Jehoiakim, who ruled for 11 years. When that king died, Jehoiakim, uh, he was succeeded by his son, Jehoiakim. Uh, three months later, the Babylonians came along, took the king captive with his family and advisors, and took them to Babylon, along with other leaders, among them the prophet Ezekiel. Um, there the king was kept in, uh, under house arrest for 35 years until the death of King Nebuchadnezzar. And the Babylonians replaced him with his uh, uncle, Zedekiah, who became the last king of Judah. And you can read quite a bit about those last kings if you read the book of Jeremiah, because he was personally acquainted with all of them. Um, and where does Habakkuk then uh, fit into this picture? Because bear in mind, again, I want to emphasize, I'm not talking about the pagan nations around Israel. This was God's uh, people, God's church at the time. And this is the, uh, the rulership of uh, uh, that church. He most likely um, and worked during the reign of King Jehoiakim, who was so well liked by the people that at his funeral, his body was dragged off like that of a donkey and thrown outside the city gate. Just imagine, even uh, in our nation, if uh, the president or the leader of the nation is so popular that people uh, throw him on the uh, in the dumps. That's how they treated Jehoiakim. 
They liked him so well. And he was the only king that we know of who wanted to have the pleasure and personal satisfaction of killing a prophet himself. He had his, uh, the prophet has uh, prophesied something, uh, and then he, uh, the prophet fled down to Egypt. But Jehoiakim sent his servants down to Egypt, not to kill him, but to bring him back so he could have the pleasure of killing him. God's messenger. And then when God sent a message uh, through Jeremiah to that king, and um, uh, it was being read in uh, those ancient scroll, from those ancient scrolls. And we are told that whenever uh, the reader had read about three or four columns of uh, the message, the king took his knife, cut it off, and threw it into the fire. That's how he responded to God's message. And then uh, God also had to intervene and uh, hide Jeremiah, who had sent the message, and his uh, servant, the scribe, uh, Baruch. And he had to hide them so the king couldn't find him uh, and kill him. And this took place the same year when Daniel was being brought from his home to Babylon. This was the environment that we find uh, Habakkuk uh, in. At the same time, one superpower, Assyria, which had been their enemy for centuries, had just been uh, obliterated, but another superpower was coming, uh, and that was Babylon. And that's where Habakkuk enters the picture. And he has a major problem. The problem is not primarily the nations. His major problem is God. The social order in Judah had been pro completely broken down, and God did not seem to uh, be intervening in spite of Habakkuk's repeated prayer. Like we read here in the beginning of the book of Habakkuk. How long, O Lord, will I call for help? And thou wilt not hear. I cry out to thee violence, yet thou dost not save. Why are you not doing something, God? And here he uses one of the key words in the book of Habakkuk, the word violence. It occurs seven times in the book. Uh, Habakkuk uses it twice, but God uses it five times. So even in God's eyes, there really was violence going on. Not only among the pagan nations, but also in, uh, within his uh, own uh, people group. And then uh, notice how God answers. God does not rebuke Habakkuk for uh, criticizing him. In verse 5, we read that God answers Habakkuk and says, Look, I am doing something. Look around. No, uh, I am doing something. But the thing is, Habakkuk, if I told you about it, you wouldn't believe it. Is proved to be true. But still, God goes ahead and tells him what he is uh, doing. He says um, that he has appointed the upcoming uh, Babylonians to act as a whip uh, on his people. They are fierce and powerful, quick and thorough, fearless and dreaded. That's the nation that he sent uh, into uh, and punish uh, his people for their wickedness and violence. So God meets the problem of his people with appropriate actions. You see, violence uh, leads to violence. Lack of justice calls for justice. Absence of authority based on God's instructions calls for authority based in the humans themselves. And as you read, for instance, in uh, verse 7, um, 
It says uh, they are uh, talking about the Babylonians. Uh, they are dreaded and feared. Their justice and authority originate with themselves. They uh, were not, didn't want to be, uh, were not responsible to God, they felt. They just based on, we are the strong ones. We can do whatever we wanted, want to do. And then he describes how they are using that power. Uh, but it's very interesting to notice that God expresses a very important principle, notice in verse 11 in chapter 1. It says, they will sweep through like the wind and pass on, but they will be held guilty, they whose strength is their God. So even if God was uh, using them as a whip uh, on his people, he says, I am holding them responsible for how they use that power. Uh, they didn't want to have anything to do with God. They said, uh, our, uh, our strength is our God. And God said, I hold you responsible for how you use your power. And that is a kind of an interesting principle, that God will hold each nation responsible for its actions, even if they may not acknowledge him. They are still responsible for their, uh, their actions. You remember, Habakkuk had the problem that God wasn't doing anything. When God told him that he was doing uh, something, notice how Habakkuk uh, reacts. Verses 12 through 17 tells us uh, about the reaction of Habakkuk. Then Habakkuk says, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? And we will not die. Thou, O Lord, hast appointed them to judge. Uh, <clears throat> and thou, O Rock, hast established them to correct. You cannot do that, God. Uh, you cannot use a nation that is more wicked than your people in order to, uh, in order to uh, punish them. God, you can't do that. So uh, and that's the uh, key message of the book of Habakkuk. First, God, uh, Habakkuk complains God isn't doing anything. And when God tells him that he is doing something, he says, you can't do it that way. You have to do it uh, differently. And he uh, explains to God why he is dissatisfied with that. Uh, and then ultimately, when you come to in chapter 2, and, and then Habakkuk realizes, uh-uh, perhaps I've said too much. Um, but he said, it's good to get it off my chest. And he says uh, that, but uh, when God rebukes me, I'll try to answer uh, for myself. I'll try to have an answer uh, to his uh, uh, reprimand. We see that Habakkuk had a mind of his own. He was a man of strong character who was offended by the evils of his society, but he also had a relationship with God which made a real communion with him uh, uh, possible. He had faith in God, in his goodness and righteousness, but however, he was not uh, just a yes man, not even to God. He seems to be quite ready even to argue with, God, uh, with the Lord about his methods. If this will bring a reproof from God, so be it. He is, going, uh, he is ready to be reproved, and he will try to have an answer uh, ready afterwards. Then comes a very interesting st statement uh, in uh, verses uh, 2 and 3. Because it was pre uh, perhaps presumptuous to talk to God this way, but God did not reprove him uh, for it. God gave us our minds, and he expects us to use it. He wants us to think for ourselves. Although he expects us to have faith in him, he does not want uh, this to be a blind, unreasoning submission. 
God invites us to bring our difficulties to him, but he also expects us to use our minds to the full capacity. So uh, then in chapter 2, God explains to uh, Habakkuk what he is doing and why. <clears throat> and he first uh, reminds Habakkuk about the reliability of his plan. It says, God answered me and said, record the vision and scribe it on tablets that the one who reads it may run. Older Adventists who have been uh, in the church uh, for a long time, they may recognize, uh, I don't know if you can, you see uh, ba uh, the basic idea perhaps, as uh, a statue from Daniel, the beast of Daniel uh, and the revelation uh, in a chart. And um, these were famous charts in the beginning of Adventism to uh, preach uh, the gospel and preach the message of the Bible. Actually, the idea for this chart is based on this particular verse. It says um, that the, the one, uh, write it on tablets so that the one uh, who, uh, in many translations it says, that the one who runs may read it. Uh, so put it on charts so it is so easy that when people look at it, uh, uh, even if they, uh, in a pass, uh, as they pass by, they will get the message. So that's the basis for these charts that you uh, find in the history of Adventism in the beginning especially. And then uh, notice in verse 33, God says, uh, I'll be doing what I have told you I'll be doing. The vision is yet for appointed time. It hastens toward the goal and it will not fail. And though it tarries, wait for it. God is, uh, it will certainly come, it will not delay. God does not work according to our schedule. God has his own schedule. And he says, uh, don't worry. Even if you don't see the exact fulfillment of uh, all details yet, it doesn't mean that I'm not going to do it. I have my own time plan and I put it into effect when it, the, uh, the results uh, from it are most uh, likely, when it is going to be uh, necessary. Then I will bring it about. But the vision is uh, um, certain. I am not changing my mind. And then he uh, gives a very, very important principle in uh, verse 4, chapter 2. He talks about two groups of people. He says, Behold, as, uh, as for your proud ones, his soul is not right with him. The one who is on the wrong track, he is, uh, uh, his soul is not right with him. There's something wrong with his, uh, that person. And he uh, describes uh, then those people uh, in the rest of the chapter. But then he says um, uh, another very important principle. He says, for the righteous will live by his faith. The unrighteous, he is going to suffer, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Actually, most of us expected to find this in the New Testament. It is three times mentioned in the New Testament, but it is drawn from Habakkuk. And it draws together uh, in a very interesting way three key terms of the Bible. It is the word righteous and the live and faith. And it's an, uh, interesting how it is, uh, happens. Uh, because um, this uh, statement is found four, t uh, four times in the Bible, three, once in Habakkuk, three times in the New Testament. It became the basis for Paul's uh, preaching and theology. 
It was also the starting point uh, of uh, the Reformation under Luther. He based it on these words, the faith, uh, the righteous shall live by his faith. And the uh, interesting thing is, the word righteous occurs uh, uh, about 300 times in the Bible. The word live uh, occurs, uh, occur, occurs more than 1,000 times in the Bible, and the live uh, is found about 250 times. So it is uh, very co uh, common terms in the uh, Bible. But the combination of these is uh, also quite interesting. I'm not going to go into all the details, but this is the only text in the Bible where all these three are mentioned together. Righteous, live, and faith. All in one verse. And the New Testament ones are just a quotation of Habakkuk's statement. And actually, it's very interesting that the uh, ancient times uh, Jews began to recognize this, that uh, God's ways are not complicated. They thought that they had to uh, do all kinds of, uh, fulfill all kinds of law requirements. Uh, and they, uh, one of them, uh, one uh, rabbi, uh, shortly after the time of Christ, said there are 630 laws in the, uh, in the Bible, 365 negative, one for each day, 248 positive, one for each part of the body, they said. David reduced them to 11, Isaiah to 6, Amos and Habakkuk to 1. So what God points out here is uh, to Habakkuk, I'm not uh, you're not going to be saved because of uh, all the goodness of everybody else, that I'm going to fix every, uh, every problem for you right here and now. That's not what, what is going to uh, help you. What is going to help you is your re right relationship with me. Because that's what uh, faith uh, is all about. Faith is not just believing something that is unbelievable. Faith, uh, uh, the basic meaning of the word faith in the Hebrew language is trust. So the one who has the right relationship with God, he is going to live because he trusts God. And uh, then he has, uh, uh, we find five woes in uh, chapter 2, God is, is pointing out that there are, uh, what is happening in the world is that the people are reaping the harvest of their uh, own wickedness. And uh, twice he points out, for instance, he says, when you're, uh, uh, you're doing wickedness, you are sinning against yourself. When you're oppressing others, you are making them uh, uh, your enemies, and they will get back to you. And then he says, um, uh, another place, uh, violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you. So he says, um, uh, you reap what you sow. And when uh, Habakkuk realizes this, then he completely changes his, uh, his attitude. God points out to him in the end of chapter 2, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Remember, God is in ultimate control. Don't worry, even if uh, everything seems to be uh, tearing apart. Uh, that's just what is a result of wickedness that is controlling the world. But remember, I am ultimately in control. And then Habakkuk breaks into a song. Chapter 3 is actually a hymn. It says, a prayer of Habakkuk according to Sikhi North, and uh, at the end it says, for a choir director on my stringed instruments. He composes a hymn that is uh, uh, to be sung by the choir with an orchestra. And what he goes through in chapter three, just to say briefly, 
is he shows what God has been doing among God's people when Habakkuk looks back. He sees how God has been working with his people uh, throughout the years and throughout the centuries. And then he says, Thou didst go forth for the salvation of thy people, for the salvation of thine anointed. He realizes God is out there to save his people. And then when you come to uh, verse 15 and onward, then uh, uh, he even becomes more shocked. He realizes, uh, first of all, God is out there to save his people, but not only to save his people. Notice verse uh, 17 especially. Though the fig tree should not blossom and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail and the fields produce no food, uh, though the flock should be cut off from the field and there be no cattle in the stalls. Tell me, which would you prefer to live under the conditions uh, Habakkuk described in the first few verses in, in the book or these? If you had a choice. I think you would say, uh, well, uh, you would uh, have the wickedness and so on because it's possible you survive there. But if this happens, you don't have any food or anything to live from. So the conditions in the end are much more severe than the beginning. But notice how uh, Habakkuk responds to that. He says, yet, in spite of the fact that things are uh, much worse than I described in the beginning, he says, I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Notice what's happening. He realizes God is not uh, out there just to save his people. He is my savior. He is out there to save me. So what I am worried about, God is in control. And he's ultimately there to save me. Uh, the Lord God is my strength. And he has made my feet like hind's feet. He makes me walk on my high places. Habakkuk realizes, God is out there to save me. So what I'm worried about, God is going to tear and take care of all the wickedness. Uh, and those who uh, are wicked, they will have to take the consequences. But he is my savior. I need not worry. That is to me, that's one reason uh, that I uh, say the book of Habakkuk is one of my favorite books in the Bible because it tells me what is uh, it's a summary of what the, really the whole world history is about. There is wickedness in the world because sin entered the world and uh, people have chosen to follow that path. But God is out there to uh, rescue his people and not only his people, he's out there to rescue me. The question is, how do I respond to it? Do I rejoice like Habakkuk did? I hope so. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that in spite of all the wickedness that is uh, going on in the world, but even uh, some places within the church, fights and uh, uh, conflicts, you have told us, don't worry. I am out there to save my people, and I am your savior. So uh, trust me, you, uh, if you trust me, you will live by your faith. Help us to do that, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray and thank you. Amen.